Now, Patrick, many of the questions that have been coming in have been all about you and your home here in Selsey and your collection of astronomical artwork and your many, many books. And we have unearthed an old edition of The Sky at Night on Betamax Video, which uh, gives us some rather nice clues into how you got started in astronomy. Who's here? Good evening. I say, how terribly interesting. Now, let's see if everything is as it should be. Hmm, that's one of mine, and that's one of mine, that's one of mine, that's one of mine, and that's one of Arthur's. Bless him, still doing his mysterious world, chasing yetis. Now, as you know, at the time of the very first edition of The Sky at Night, in 1957, I was most reassured to meet a future version of myself from the 50th anniversary of the programme in 2007. This was very, very encouraging and very charming indeed. And so now, if my calculations are correct, and they usually are, this should be around about the time of the 700th edition of The Sky at Night in the year 2011. So I thought I'd come to that very special anniversary from my very special anniversary in 1982, the 25th anniversary of the programme, and see if I can help my future self out once again. I think that should be very, very splendid indeed. Crystals! Well, 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 Patrick, how very terribly nice to see you once again. Nice to see you. Um, what year do you come from? 1982, time of the Ooh. 25th anniversary of the Sky Night. That was a good year, wasn't it? Very, very good year. Yeah, very I good know, year it indeed. was indeed. So, yes. for the 700th edition, I understand we are trying our very, very best to answer the very intelligent questions from our intelligent and dedicated viewers. Yes. Let's see what they're after. Yes, let's see the nature of the questions being asked in 2011. John Roach of Aberdeen, thank you for your question. Sir Patrick. Oh, are we a sir now? I am now, but I wasn't then. No, I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. No. Sir Patrick. Is Sir Patrick really the only living human to have met the first man to fly, to go into space and land on the moon? I can't be sure, but I think it probably is true. Uh, the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, I know, of course. The first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. And finally, all the other right, the first man to fly. And I met him when I was learning how to fly at the very start of the war, way back in 1939-40. Yes, Orville Wright, a very mild man and man of great humility. Very much so. Next, from Ellen Hartmeyer in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. What are the cartoon-like pictures that can sometimes be seen in Sir Patrick's office? They seem to be very strange creatures. They are indeed. They are drawn indeed. by my mother, who was a very clever artist. And she said, no one can say that I'm wrong. And all her creatures are nice looking creatures. So they're, they're benevolent. They, they are, are very benevolent aliens indeed. She had the music and the art. I got the music. I didn't get the art. And finally, from Michael Murphy in County for Manor, what has been your greatest achievement over the last 50 years of doing the sky at night and your career? I've tried to do one thing, to interest other people in astronomy, show them what a marvellous study it is, bring them into it as a hobby, possibly as a profession, and give them something very to enrich their lives. That's what I've tried to do, whether I've managed it well, it's for others to judge, but I've done my best. Absolutely. Astronomy, the greatest of all the sciences, and anyone can try it. Well, Patrick, thank you very much. You know, perhaps in 30 years' time, we'll be doing this program up again, and this time, I'll be you. I do hope so, and that would make me very happy indeed. I shall return to the 25th anniversary. I wish you all the very best, not only for the 700th episode, but also for your 55th anniversary next year in 2012. Thank you very much indeed. Many congratulations, and Thank as always, it's terribly nice to meet me. Nice to see you, Patrick. And you, Patrick, as well. Until next time, God bless. Good night. Patrick, thank you very much. No, thank you, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, um, I've enjoyed talking to myself. Yes, our other selves. <laughs> I wonder. Our next guest is the Astronomer Royal, who's joining us to answer your questions about the universe. Yeah, we've got a message. But first, Professor Martin Rees has a cup of tea and talks telescopes. Okay. Where is that? 
uh, <laughs> probably near to Paranal in in in, uh, oh, yeah. uh, in Chile. But, yeah. uh, um, they're very close to where the VOT is. Mm. Right, everybody happy? Okay, right, we are recording. Okay, Patrick? Well, um, over the years of the Sky at Night, we've touched on dark matter and similar topics quite often. But when we called in for our questions, and over a thousand came in for this programme, the most popular by far was cosmology. Right, uh, can we have our first question, please? Mm, here it is from Alex Andrews of Oxford. Where exactly is the centre of the universe and where is our solar system and galaxy in relation to it? Uh, yes. Mm. There's no place in our universe which is more central than any other place. This is, I guess, what's called the Copernican principle, which does seem to be obeyed by our universe. Every part seems to have had the same history as every other part. Am, I wrong, am I wrong here, Martin? Yes. I'm asked that question, I say um, the Big Bang happened everywhere. Well, indeed, it was one point, but that point has now had its aftermath everywhere, so we can't localise it at all. No. We're not in a central position. One of the most counterintuitive things I think cosmologists say to me is that so if the universe is infinite now, which it may well be, mm. probably is, then it was infinite then. It was born infinite, wasn't it? In, but with in everything in one place. All the space that's here now yes. was there then. In effect, because we don't quite know whether the universe is infinite or just uh, huge but finite. Yeah. Um, but uh, it could still have been infinite, even if it was really tiny. Yeah. <laughs> I love it when astronomy gets so <laughs> exhaustingly <laughs> confusing yeah. that that's a wonderful thing. Uh, what is our universe expanding into? Ah, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, here again, the issue is, uh, is our universe infinite or not? Uh, if it's finite, then it must sort of close up on itself. So the analogy people use is a surface of a sphere like that, where if you go on the sphere, you just go round and round, you don't get to an edge. And similarly, one dimension up, uh, many people think that the universe could be finite, but have no edge. So it would then be finite and it would expand, just as you could imagine that whole sphere being expanded. Well, an added complication what is one of the things we're looking for at CERN on the speculative end is extra dimensions in the universe. Mm -hmm. Those are real, there are real theories that predict or suggest there may be extra dimensions and that would mean that what we call our universe now is a sheet, could be a sheet, a four-dimensional sheet floating around in a higher dimensional well, box, that box which yes. would... Well, that's right. The dimensions in string theory are normally thought to be very Cold, tightly wound yes. up, so they only affect at small scales. But that may not be true. They may be detectable on the scales measured at CERN. But then, as you say, there is the idea that perhaps uh, um, our universe is, as it were, alongside another. You can imagine uh, this table and a parallel table up here, and ants crawling around on this table. Mm -hmm. We think they're in a two-dimensional universe. They wouldn't be aware of another population, and likewise, one dimension up, there could be uh, another universe just that far away from ours, yeah. but if that distance measured in some fourth spatial dimension, uh, we're imprisoned in our three. We one, nice th one nice thing about that, it's mm. still speculation, but mm. that, this is a potential explanation for why gravity is weak compared to the other forces, which is something we'd like yes, to try and understand, indeed. but if you allow gravity to leak off your universe and exist in these yeah. other dimensions, then you've explained why to us Gravity appears weaker it's than going the other. It's a very deep water, so I think <laughs> <laughs> it could be very shallow water, but in, a, in an extra dimension. Wrong, <laughs> it's much more fun when we don't have the evidence, Patrick. We can speculate. Well, the next one we have from Peter Burgess of Gloucester. How does gravity bend light if photons have no mass? <laughs> well, <laughs> photons have energy, not mass, but I think uh, um, that's a kind of question that Newton would have worried about when he thought of uh, gravity as the standard inverse square law, etc. I mean, I My own definition of gravity is quite simple. Gravity is the force that gives mass weight. <laughs> well, right. I yes. think, but I think it's the most incredible thing, the, the ultimate example of Einstein's theory, is that if I take this glass now and, and drop it, everything falls at the same rate in a gravitational field. If I took a laser and fired it in that direction, if there was enough ground, it would hit the ground at the same time as the glass, because light falls at the same rate in a gravitational field as everything else. Yeah. The, the point is, though, that it goes 186,000 miles a second, so if this took a second to hit the ground, it would have missed the Earth. But if the Earth were big enough, it would hit the ground at the same time, because yes. it travels through the same curved space. And, and the um, fact that everything falls at the same speed is a, <laughs> is a natural consequence of Einstein's theory, whereas to Newton, it was not obvious. Well, 
<laughs> we were up here quite so. <laughs> I'm rather stunned. <laughs> what about you, John? Are you stunned at your have got any more questions? Completely and, and wonderfully. And, uh, any more questions for us? Lightsabers are seen in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Lightsabers. Lightsabers are seen in Star Wars. That's an engineering problem, John. Yeah, yeah that, that, you're asking the wrong people. <laughs> well, that was a, a, a marvellous discussion. And I hope everyone understood it and it's now absolutely clear as to what it was all about. Well, Martin, really. thank you so much. It's been a great honour to have you with us. For our last section, we've been joined by Dr Brian May. He started out as an astronomer before being lured away by the bright lights of rock music. As the Astronomer Royal left, he made an intriguing observation. Um, I don't know any scientist who looks as much like Isaac Newton as you do. I would enjoy that, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 that sorry. will be my after-dinner um, yeah, comment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Brian is going to help us answer some of the more general questions. OK, we are recording. Let's begin with the questions. Let's have the first one, John. And it comes from Adrian Barnard from Didcot. What inspired the panel to take up astronomy with such a passion? This is a very easy question, and I, in common with thousands and thousands of, of other people in, in Britain, my inspiration was you, Patrick, of course. A little book which was in my school library called The Earth, and I borrowed it, and I think I almost never gave it back. I just read it from cover to cover over and over again, and I discovered about the formation of the Earth and trilobites and the emergence of life, and I was hooked forever. And I used to beg to be able to, to be allowed to stay up and watch the sky at night. So I had forgotten that little book I wrote years and years ago. It's a wonderful book. Still. Right, come on to you. Um, well, it will be no great surprise, Patrick, that it was you again, yeah. but not a book this time. I sat in my first term at Talkie Boys Grammar School in the audience oh, yes, for a public lecture you gave on the uh, outer planets. And you talked for an hour, and I don't remember the hour, but what I remember is what you said right at the end. You came straight to the front of the stage, and you said, well, I've told you what we know about the outer planets, but the truth is we don't know very much, and by the time any of you grow up, then we'll need to have found out a lot more. And it was the first time I'd heard an adult say, we don't know everything yet. And I thought, I want to do that. So um, it's entirely your fault. I still don't know much about the outer planets. No, though. Right. And, you, <laughs> and you came up to me after and began talking to me. I thought then we'll keep an eye on this boy. <laughs> <laughs> Very kind of right, you to say. Come to you. Well, Brilliant. again, at the risk of being repetitive, it was a book that you wrote, but I've got it here. <laughs> so I brought it with me. It's this one. It's the Observer's Book of Astronomy. Patrick Moore, there it is, Fantastic. and it was, uh, it was, I know when it was because I got it as a school prize in 1978, so I chose it as a what school prize. What was the prize, prize for? I, unfortunately for me, I thought it was, when I remembered this, I thought it must be physics or science, it's for 100% attendance, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not distinguished in that sense, but yes, yes it was th this, this book. It's in the fact. same series as the other. Oh, and I also asked for that for, for the book that I had as a school prize, strangely yeah. enough. Yeah. Because, because I'd worn out the copy that I got from the school library. Fantastic. What well, John, what, what about you? Well, Patrick, once again, it was you. And I remember being off school uh, one afternoon with measles or something, and I watched a repeat of The Sky at Night uh, one afternoon on BBC Two. And there you were. I'd never seen any presenter speak this way, and I was fascinated. <laughs> so I was inspired into astronomy and impressions as well. And, and that's, that's because of you. Well, I'm flattered. In my case, it was picking up a book, The Story of the Civil System by G.F. Chambers, published in 1898. I read it when I was seven in 1930. Mm. Right, uh, next question, John. This one comes from Mark Ike of Birchington in Kent. After all the previous shows, uh, can you pick a highlight or is there an episode, uh, Sir Patrick, that sticks in your mind that has a real wow factor? Shall I begin this one? This one's for you. The first photograph back from the other side of the moon. The Russians have said they'd send them over as soon as they got them from the probe Lunic 3, which was going around the moon, and they had used my charts, and they promised to send the photographs, and they did. And I was actually on the air live when they, they came through. So that was a great moment, I may say. Um, what about you? I think it would have to be the first moon landing. Yes. Sir. I was down in Cornwall with uh, 
my drummer, Roger, and in his mum's house, and we just sat there watching a TV screen about this big, and there you were. And it was all very unreal. I, I think about it a lot, and it seemed like the most unlikely and sort of modern thing that could possibly happen. It's a long time ago now, isn't it? You know, but, it is indeed. Um, but that's an unforgettable moment, and I think it's one of these things everybody knows where they were at that, that instant when it was one small step for, for mankind and, and one giant step for mankind, or whatever it was. I think he was slightly confused as well, wasn't yeah. he? <laughs> but um, wonderful. I'll never forget that time. We were seeing things actually as they happened, or rather one and a quarter seconds later. What was you? The night Huygens, the probe, landed on Titan, yes. and I was at mission control, and because we'd already got to know the scientists, because we'd had them on the sky at night, we just stood in the corridor, more or less, and grabbed people as they came past, as this story unfolded of a probe that they'd built landing on Titan and sending back the first images from, from this wonderful world. As yet, we've still got no scientific data from Huygens. And there, there it is! We have seen the impact of the probe with the surface directly from two sensors. That's not my favourite bit. My favourite bit didn't get on camera. Just outside, there were a bunch of amateur astronomers with telescopes pointing at Saturn. And there was this line of scientists and engineers who'd built the thing that had landed on Titan, but who'd never seen Titan. And they were going up one by one and just looking. And I thought that, that summed up the sky at night, the professional and then the amateur telescopes. I think having both at once was a wonderful moment. Well, I did have a letter once from a, a serious astronomer, whom I won't name, who made an important discovery of a nova. He made a completely independent discovery of Saturn. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Abjit This is my first sky at night. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, this one is my oh, favourite. Because my first. <laughs> what about you? Well, I do rather love those moments where things perhaps don't go to plan, <laughs> and that right. brings out your wonderful sense of humour. I can't no. see a single star at the moment. It's totally obscured. I remember phrases like, oh dear, we're completely clouded out, oh dear. It's coming out, yes, there is the moon, I can see it for the moment. No, it's gone again. It's gone, it's however. It's infuriating, and there's nothing one can do. Well, never mind. These things happen and we can't control it. No telescope yet built will show a star. It's gone, anything said, point of light. Is it gone? Oh, no. Just as I got it on the crosswires, it blacked right out. How absolutely typical. There's nothing we can do about it. I can't move a 24-inch telescope quicker than that. No, I'm afraid you can't. And you've got a wonderful sort of stoicism when things the don't things go to plan. Right. Yes. I, right. I think that's a wonderful quality of yours that I always admire. <laughs> well, um, I feel very really honest. So, I hope you've enjoyed our 700th Sky at Night. An anniversary and quite a record, I think. Your questions have been both challenging and illuminating. With over a thousand, we've barely been able to scratch the surface. But go to bbc.co.uk slash skyatnight and you'll find answers to a few more of your astronomical queries. Well, uh... End of one year. And now, next month I come back and we have the first program of our next 700. Until then, good night. <laughs>